Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. We still have people uh, signing up, but we're going to go ahead and start at two o'clock sharp. Uh, my name is Joe Shemtov, and welcome to our virtual session today uh, called uh, Uncovering the Real James Bond. Um, today, you'll be hearing uh, Jim Wright talk about, uh, he's going to give a great slide presentation. And then he's going to uh, share with you some objects from our Mary Wickham Bond Papers uh, collection, which are amazing. Uh, before he does start, uh, I would like to remind everybody who is here that the uh, free library is open. So uh, anyone can just hop in, come on by. The doors are wide open. We are open from uh, 9 to five o'clock, Monday through Friday. And uh, any one of you can make an appointment to see the very objects that Jim Wright will be showing you. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's all yours, Jim. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen and we'll get the talk started here. Welcome. So this is sort of a meet the real James Bond, finally. Uh, originally, I planned to do this talk in person with everyone uh, 18 months ago. And of course, my book came out at the same time as COVID arrived. So this is the next best thing to talking in, in person to everybody. I'm doing a special Zoom talk from the rare book department of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Free Library and the Rare Book Department. They have been so terrific to me. Uh, anytime I needed any kind of research, they would help. Uh, they're, they're just terrific all around. And I want to make a little plug before I start. If you can get a chance to take a tour of the Rare Book Department, which are free uh, Mondays through Fridays at 11 a.m., it is one of the, the great tours in Philadelphia can't speak highly enough of it. So who was the real James Bond? Uh, I did an article for Smithsonian Magazine last week, and there'll be a link to that article later in the, in the, uh, the Zoom cast here. But who was the real James Bond? Uh, a little about me, uh, like the real James Bond, I'm a Philadelphia boy. Uh, I go by Jim, not James. I'm about six foot two, like the real James Bond, uh, and I like birds. So I guess I was destined to write this book about the real Bond. Uh, I've also written two other little known uh, sports biographies of famous Philadelphians, Mike Schmidt, uh, baseball's young lion at the time, and I wrote about Bobby Clark, pride of the team. So the real James Bond is sort of the third in the trilogy of great Philadelphians. So who is the real James Bond? This guy who made his world uh, United States premiere of Die, uh, No Time to Die. <laughs> this one's called No Time to Die, the 25th James Bond movie starring Daniel Craig. And of course, he's next to that iconic Aston Martin DB5. Uh, so was this that guy, is it Sean Connery? Uh, this guy. He's the bird man from the cover of my book or the real deal. And that is kind of a bad picture of the real James Bond at the Willow Grove Air Fair in 1965. And his wife told him he had to pose in front of the picture. Uh, there was a, a trivia genius question online earlier this year. Uh, who was James Bond named after? A real life spy, the creator's neighbor, an ornithologist for a UK prime minister. Uh, I was depressed to find out that only 22% of the uh, viewers said it was an ornithologist to see. So I think everyone should buy my book and get the answer right. So a little about the book, it was published last year, but is still picking up steam because of COVID and the, the arrival of that 25th James Bond movie. 
the cover, it, the book's by Schiffer. I love the cover. Uh, they call the guy on the cover the bird man. And that is a Cuban green woodpecker head uh, on top of a nice herringbone suit. And the guy's actually uh, carrying binoculars, which I thought was a really nice touch as well. Uh, the book is amply illustrated. And you'll see some of the illustrations today. The free library, the rare book department were instrumental in probably 20 to 25 of the 100 illustrations in the book because the, the archives here are a treasure trove. But to give you an idea of some of the really colorful illustrations in the book. Uh, growing up Bond, I'll go through this quickly, but James Bond was you know, born in Philadelphia on Pine Street, uh, not far from Rittenhouse Square, born extremely rich. The Bonds had their own townhouse. Uh, the lady on the left is Bond's mother, and she was a, uh, a Roebling of the Brooklyn Bridge building Roeblings. I give you an idea of the kind of money she had. Uh, that's Francis Bond in the middle, and then young Jim Bond on the right. On the far right is Francis Bond Sr., Jim's father. He was a founding partner of E.B. Smith and Company, later became Smith Barney, which made money the old fashioned way they earned it. Uh, when Bond was four, his seven year old sister uh, had a ruptured appendix when they were vacationing as they usually spent their summers in Maine. She had a ruptured appendix. Uh, the father raced to see his dying daughter traveling by special train and yacht in Maine in time to see her. And, and he was such a big deal. This made like front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, but it was a real tragedy, and I think it really affected the whole family. Uh, to get over the tragedy, they built a mansion out uh, in the far suburbs of Philadelphia, a uh, 234-acre estate, and that is the manor house called Willowbrook. And today, the campus of Gwynedd Mercy University is the former Bond estate, and that the Bond manor house there is now the administration building and it is beautiful you know walnut paneling inside just reeks of wealth uh, after after bond's sister died they moved to this new house tragedy struck again bond's mother died uh, bond's father quickly remarried a woman from england he gave her that mansion for a wedding present and then moved the family to England. So the real James Bond was educated at Harrow, a uh, pretty exclusive school in London and did not have a good time. Uh, he was bullied. He was you know, called a cowboy or an Indian, made fun of his language, uh, his accent. So he had a tough time. Uh, he then went on to uh, study at Cambridge's Trinity College and basically Bond, although an American ornithologist, had a British education, spent his teen years mostly in Great Britain. Uh, after school, uh, a young Bond got a job with the Pennsylvania Bank Company, which is now El Del Frisco's Steakhouse at 15th and Chestnut, I believe. But he did not like banking whatsoever and decided he would instead get a job at the Academy of Natural Sciences, uh, right across Logan Square from uh, the Free Library. And Bond got a job there unpaid as an ornithologist, self-taught. And he realized he'd gotten a small inheritance. He realized if he lived like a pauper, uh, he could work at the free, at the, excuse me, the, the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, work for free and do what he wanted. And that was to explore the West Indies and describe the bird life there. So for 10 years, Bond would travel to the West Indies by boat. And uh, it was quite an ordeal because he would get seasick on the way. And no matter where he went in the West Indies, the first day of his travels, he was pretty sick. Uh, when he got to his destination, this is the Zapata Swamp in Cuba and Bond, uh, spent months there uh, looking for rare birds and he lived with the locals. 
and he ate what the locals ate, which was uh, often a uh, like a cooked rodent for lunch and dinner. So pretty primitive uh, traveling. It's not like these Vanderbilt expeditions where they would travel in style and have porters carry all their gear for them and collect the birds and skin them and do all the dirty work. Bond was the loner, did it all by himself. The tools of his trade, uh, on the upper left, you'll see a pocket knife with a blade called, it's called a spay blade, and that's for flesh only. I found that the Academy of Natural Sciences, I thought it was amazing that Bond had a blade etched for flesh only, which sounded like an Ian Fleming novel. Uh, Bond also carried arsenic to preserve the, the specimens, the bird skins that he collected. And he often used a double-barreled shotgun to collect the bird. So it was kind of interesting to see the tools of the trade of the real James Bond and the 007 weren't that far apart from each other. Uh, so after 10 years, Bond uh, put all his research together and did a book called Birds of the West Indies. It was published by the Academy of Natural Sciences after Joe Lippincott of Philadelphia, famous publisher, said, sorry, this is something for the museums, not for a publisher. Turns out, of course, that Joe Lippincott was wrong. The book stayed in print most of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Uh, in so many editions, I've lost track of them all. I know that the first edition, if you could find an autographed copy, it would be worth a small fortune. The second uh, edition, that green cover in the upper left, recently sold uh, photographed for $5,000. Uh, this is the story from the horse's mouth, Ian Fleming, on how he stole the real James Bond's name for his secret agent. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his stories? Well, it isn't only the hero. I mean, I generally pick up names just driving through the countryside, uh, through villages and so on. You'll see an interesting name uh, over a tobacconist or chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whoever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. And that's how it happened. So oh, uh, Fleming steals Bond's name, but 007 does not become a household name in the United States for almost 10 years. And Bond didn't realize that his name had been stolen for this secret agent. And Bond and his wife, Mary, started to get late night calls from breathless young women going, hello, could I speak to James, please? And they didn't, they couldn't understand what was going on until a friend wrote to them and said, hey, do you know this author, Ian Fleming, just confessed to stealing your husband's name for his secret agent, 007 James Bond. So Mary Bond realizes where all these calls are coming from and writes to uh, Ian Fleming, accusing him of stealing Bond's identity. And uh, I actually found the letter from Fleming to Mrs. James Bond in the Rare Book Department this summer. And I'm going to show some documents here in a little while. And this was one of them. And it's, it is so much fun beginning from the address, Mrs. James Bond. And it was addressed to her in Philadelphia, Pasadena because the secretary in England didn't know what PA stood for and took a guess. So just a bunch of cool stuff on that document. I also found these carbon copies of the free library bond archives as well. And this is a letter from Mary Bond to the head of the rare book department explaining why she was giving all the 007 and Ian Fleming material to the free library and not to the Academy of Natural Sciences across the way. 
And it also had this description of, of how James Bond felt about having his name stolen. And it, it's pretty touching. I, I'll read that to you uh, when we get to the documents as well. Now, there's also a book that got away. And when I was doing the research in the free library, it said that the autographed copy that Ian Fleming wrote to the real James Bond from the thief of his identity was donated to the, the rare book department of the free library. And Mary Bond was on the board of the free library. So I, I asked, hey, what happened? Where's the, the autographed copy of you only live twice. This is probably, this is, could be the greatest of all inscribed uh, Ian Fleming books to the real James Bond from the author who made him famous. Uh, so I, I asked and I said, you know, we think that the Bond book was auctioned off. We found out that it was auctioned off by Sotheby's and uh, we're not, exactly sure how she got her hands on it again to put it up for auction. And I talked to uh, David Contasta, an author who had written a lot about Mary and James Bond. And he said that a friend of Mary Bond's told her, by the way, that photographed copy, that signed copy of Ian Fleming's You Only Live Twice is a lot of money. You shouldn't give it to the library. You should sell it at auction. So. Mary Bond uh, borrowed the book back, and instead of returning it, she sold it at auction for about $30,000, I believe. It later was re-auctioned off in uh, 2008, and it sold for a grand total of $80,000. And in my book, I wrote the whole history of this book, and I kind of lamented the fact that instead of being in a rare book department of the free library where anyone could see this famous book. Uh, it was in the hands of a private collector for his or her eyes only. And after the book came out, uh, I got a Facebook message about a month later and said, Jim, we have to talk and please email me. And it was the owner of the book. And he, with this actual volume here, and he sent this picture to me. He had no idea that Mary Bond had taken the book back and auctioned it off, then it was re-auctioned. So the book now has sort of a, a great secondary history to go with the book itself. Uh, so I'm going to switch right now. Uh, instead of talking about Mary Bond, I am going to jump out of the presentation and I'm going to uh, switch to this amazing camera called the visualizer. And this is a treasure at the free library. And I, I'm able to show some of the documents I used in, in preparing the book. And this was a real treat. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of James Bond, but I could find none between 1930, you know, 1930, all the way to the 1960s. And apparently the the Academy of Natural Sciences had a publicity still of the real James Bond posing with two kids uh, who have way too much makeup on it. The whole thing looks posed, but if you look at it closely, uh, Mary Bond always insisted that her husband was more handsome than, than Sean Connery. So I thought that was pretty neat. And uh, for the book, I. I cropped out the two kids and everything. It just had the headshot of the handsome James Bond. And that's how I, I would identify the picture in, in all my images. This guy is the handsome James Bond. I thought that was pretty neat. So also came across in the rare book department, I found the copy of Rogue Magazine that this is the issue that Ian Fleming confessed to stealing the real James Bond's name. Uh, the book, the magazine itself is kind of a, a kind of not raunchy, but a little furry and interest uh, men's magazine. And uh, one of the stories in there is uh, the author of The Black Forest Jungle reports on sin and suburbia. So once the Bonds found out that 
James Bond had his name been stolen by Ian Fleming, uh, Mary Bond wrote to Ian Fleming and accused him of stealing her husband's identity. And this summer at the library, I found the original copy of the letter from Ian Fleming. I'd like to show it to you here. You can see it is addressed to Mrs. James Bond. And uh, the content is unbelievable. Uh, just read one part. So this is the first letter from Ian Fleming to Mrs. Bond. And it said that at the time, one of my Bibles was and still is Birds of the West Indies by James Bond. It struck me that this name, brief, unromantic, and yet very masculine, is just what I needed. And so James Bond II was born and started off on the career that, I must confess, has been meteoric, culminating with its grace by your president as his favorite thriller hero. See Life Magazine in the 2017th edition. So there's this dreadful, there is this dreadful confession together with limit, limitless apologies and my thanks for the fun and fame I have had from the most extraordinary chance choice of so many years ago. In return, I can only offer your James Bond unlimited use of the name Ian Fleming for whatever purpose he may think fit. And it's signed, yours, yours sincerely, Ian Fleming. And of course, it's addressed to Mrs. James Bond, Philadelphia, Pasadena, which is fairly amusing. Uh, also came across another, the library has these amazing scrapbooks. And you'll hear here in a second. And they're filled with uh, Mary Bond's uh, clippings from all her life with the real James Bond. I'm opening it up here, and this was a picture. I think it made it to the final edition of uh, the real James Bond, but that is a picture of James and Mary Bond on their honeymoon in Bermuda in 1953, just as Casino Royale was being printed in uh, Great Britain. So just these amazing pictures, if they hadn't been saved in the archives of the, the free library, I don't think people would have ever seen them. Uh, once Bond became popular, uh, turns out that Mary Bond had a few other little tricks up her sleeve. And one of them was, uh, I wanna show you, this is the real James Bond's Aston Martin, uh, DB5, and it's one of the very first produced and apparently a collector's item on its own. Uh, it has a little button you can push and uh, little machine guns in the front of the vehicle pop out and uh, act like you can fire them. And I think there's a scene in No Time to Die, that brand new James Bond movie, uh, in which he has uh, those guns in use again, probably just for old time's sake. The other thing that's really cool about this car is you push your button here and you have to watch closely. Uh, this, this car, just like the gold fingered Aston Martin DB5 has an ejector button. I'm going to push it now. <laughs> it happens so fast it's hard to see but you can actually eject the person. I went online and it turns out if you want to buy uh, a little guy that just got ejected, they cost, little, they cost $8 each themselves. One of the real treasures I discovered uh, too late for the book, but it was on a top of a shelf in the free library. This is a 007 vodka bottle with a 007 uh, or pouring device at the top, 007 vodka. And then if you look down here, it is James Bond's 007 vodka. And the free library has a clipping in which the real James Bond gives his recipe for uh, a martini. And he uses gin and his recipe says, just let fly with the gin. That was basically his recipe for uh, a martini. And it didn't matter to him 
whether it was shaken or stirred as long as it had plenty of gin and not vodka. Uh, the other last treasure I came across is a letter from Mary Bond to the head of the rare book department. And I will, I'll post this later online, but it is chock full of some real insights into what the theft of his identity meant to the real James Bond. And I, I'll read a little of it here. The truth of the matter, which I have never publicized, is that I was really angry with Fleming for admitting it was the American JB whose name he had snitched. As the legend, legend grew, the name James Bond almost became a dirty word. I decided I wanted the personal satisfaction of bringing Fleming and JB together so the former could see just what sort of man he'd done this to. I knew Jim would do nothing about it himself, but keep on wincing and detesting Ian Fleming. I got that satisfaction the day we lunched with Fleming in Jamaica. In the meantime, Seymour, another board member at the library, had the unique perspicacity to evaluate the unique quality of the situation and his objective viewpoint helped me to see my way on how to get even with Fleming. So I heaped coals of fire on the enemy's head, a much more satisfying solution than leaping into a libel suit and wrote up the whole story, making light of it. Sure enough, Jim often has a sense of humor about it and plays up to it. But I know he'd prefer to keep 007 and Ian Fleming in your safe hands on the other side of Logan Square, which is why this material is here and not in the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, I also am certain you will understand and appreciate why we are both so content and proud to have our Bondiana ensconced in the safekeeping of the library where it already has been recognized and honored. Sincerely, Mary Bond. So I'm going to switch back to the uh, talk here and sort of wrap up. So we're talking about Mary Bond. And one of the things that I really came to appreciate is she was a real character herself. She was also an excellent writer, I should add. And so the this Bond stuff hit and she embraced it, at least appeared to on the surface. I didn't realize this was her sweet revenge, but she wrote a book called How 007 Got His Name by Mrs. James Bond. And she also wrote a book later called To James Bond with Love. And she went to uh, the doctor's office with her husband and her when Jim Bond had cancer and he was pretty sick. She would visit the doctors with him and she'd say, hey, by the way, I would you like to have a copy of my new book, How you know, to Love to James Bond with Love. And the doctor would say, sure. And when she was checking out, uh, in paying the bill, she said, okay, here's the signed copy of uh, To James Bond with Love, that'll be $15, please. So she was actually sort of uh, surprising the doctors and getting sales unexpectedly because she kind of pulled a fast one on them. The funny thing is that a book like uh, To James Bond with Love signed by Mary Bond is now worth like $250. So the doctor got the last laugh. Uh, so last of all, I just want to thank you all for being here today. I'd really like to thank Joe Shemtoff and the Free Library and the Rare Book Department, uh, not just for this, this talk today, but for all the help they've given me over the past five years. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen now, and hopefully we'll, uh, if anyone has questions, I would be happy to answer them. So uh, let's, let's give that a shot. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was a, an incredible presentation. And um, I urge everyone to read uh, your book because uh, it's such a well-written book and it's so interesting on many levels. At first, uh, you think, uh, I, at least I thought, oh, he's just hooking me in to talk about ornithology. And then you kind of turn it around and then you go and talk about so many more things. 
including spies and how spies uh, were connected to ornithologists. Um, as I look at some of the questions, maybe you can talk, Jim, a little bit about that, uh, what the connection was, and if there is a connection between ornithologists and spies. You know, was, I think we were talking between ourselves that James Bond, there is no evidence that James Bond was, the real James Bond was, or had any connection to spying, but his colleagues certainly had a connection. And as yeah. you do that, I'm just gonna um, look at the questions. Yeah, so one of the things that struck me was there's a possibility that you know Jim Bond could have been a spy because there's some strange happenstance that would indicate he might be a spy. But I realized Mary Bond uh, couldn't keep a secret. So if, if Bond was a spy, believe me, she would let the world know about it. But it turned out the more I did my research, I found at least seven of Bond's uh, naturalist ornithological colleagues uh, worked with the United States government during World War II as spies. And they were perfect for spies because uh, most of them had already been to these foreign countries. They spoke the language, they knew the government, they knew the locals, they didn't raise suspicions. Uh, no one looked at them twice when they walked around carrying binoculars or shotguns. So they fit right in and it turns out that a bird watcher is British spy uh, lingo for spy. So I think Ian Fleming may have chosen James Bond as sort of an inside joke as well, you know, bird watcher and spy. Great. Okay, so we got some, uh, we got four really good questions. The first Great. one, which, which you're going to love, which we talked about, we talked about in our podcast. Uh, how was 007 the name? determined <laughs> yeah so i've i've seen so many various rumors about where 007 came from there was a title of a rudyard kipling uh short story named 007 about an american train engine there was this really totally manufactured story about a guy a famous uh explorer and you know uh, author, magician, you name it. Uh, he was a Renaissance man, literally and figuratively called John D. And uh, this guy who made up all kinds of uh, malarkey and bobbed it off as biography said that John D. signed his name with two zeros with a seven atop of it. And uh, that's how he addressed all his secret correspondence to the Queen of England at the time. And he was on his missions claiming to be uh, doing maps or uh, making trade deals when he was actually a secret agent and signing his name 007. And uh, so Joe's podcast, we had a, a wonderful librarian from Great Britain who said she curated this talk about John D and looked at every map and every piece of correspondence the guy ever wrote and there was no 007 anywhere. So just made it up. Uh, other 007 stuff claimed it was the zip code for Georgetown, part of the zip code for Georgetown where a lot of spies lived. That is true, but zip codes came in 10 years after 007 was invented. Uh, turns out that I talked to one of the uh, guy who wrote the history of the British Secret Service, and he said that during World War II, the double O code was used for all urgent top secret messages. And that's where the double O came from. And the seven is still speculation. People say it's either a lucky number, uh, just sounds good when you say 007 as opposed to 002. Uh, and that's how it came about. So uh, I've written a story about that too. It's fun to see how these crazy rumors get started and just end up being part of the mythology of James Bond. That is a, a great answer, Jim. Uh, I think you covered all the bases. Uh, second question, did anything you discovered um, through the free library significantly alter the course of your research or give you any leads you had not considered? Uh, you know, when I first started Researching the book, I wasn't sure it was going to be a book. 
And it was only because I found the treasure troves like the Free Library and the Academy of Natural Sciences. They have so many of the bird skins that Bond collected and they are time capsules and just truly amazing and birds I never realized. But the, the things I really realized reading all of Mary Bond's stuff at the Free Library was how, how affected James Bond was negatively by this theft of his identity. And one of the things I had read repeatedly uh, during my research was that James Bond knew Ian Fleming and gave him permission to use his name and he loved it. It was a wonderful relationship. Then you start reading the Mary Bond stuff and seeing how he used the words like bitter and there was one uh, thing in the book that I found in the library and she said, you know, you know, Ian Fleming died and left Jim Bond holding the bag for all this negativity. And uh, I know at the end of his life, Ian Fleming was sort of haunted by James Bond, the secret agent, because he's this young dashing guy and Ian Fleming was a guy in his 60s with a heart attack. And he couldn't live up to James Bond, the spy either. And uh, so I think that really influenced me a lot. All right. Did the real James Bond continue to travel for ornithological study? Was he ever recognized in other countries? Uh, yes. In fact, he's won medals in Jamaica and other places. He was, he continued collecting birds in the 1960s. He was, you know, retirement age and he was still writing all these uh, guides, editing his field guides, and he had checklists for the birds of the Caribbean until he was in his 80s. I mean, he, he was an ornithologist for the day he died, literally, which I was, he, I really admired Bond more and more. He was a really good guy. He did not want to be in the limelight. He was an environmentalist conservationist before it was fashionable. He was writing in the first edition saying we have to stop cutting down rainforests to make room for plantation. We have to stop the illegal trade in carrots. We have to start opening national nature preserves where hunting birds is illegal. And you think it's like no kidding, but back then this was, this was on the forefront of conservation. So I, I really admire the guy. And I think you may have answered this one. How is the real James Bond regarded as an ornithologist? Uh, I know that, uh, you know, I had previously written, uh, he, uh, James Bond wrote the, the, uh, the Bible on uh, Jamaican uh, birds. He wrote the Bible on birds. Um, can you touch up? I know you already talked about that a little bit, but. Uh, oh, yeah, he was an amazing ornithologist, got all kinds of medals and he, he came across, came up with a couple theories that for ornithology were fairly major. Uh, until Bond wrote his book, and just before it, they thought that the birds of the West Indies had come from South America. But Bond studied all of these species and insisted they were actually from North America and, and was able to prove it. And he drew a little line called Bond's line, and that's where the birds south of that line came from South America and north of Bond's line are from North America. And this was considered a major discovery and they still talk about Bond's line to this day. And some of the rare birds that he has, he collected, including the Bahama nuthatch, this was the, these, this became a distinct species. The only record they had of the birds from the 1920s when he discovered it, there's two birds that he collected down there. And the bird has since gone extinct. And some of the only records they have of this Bahama nut hatch from the 1920s are the ones that Bond collected, the ones at the Academy of Natural Sciences. And these birds are time capsules. And they can tell you what the environment of the Bahamas was like then, 
and all kinds of things genetically. And uh, so the more technology we get, the more valuable these old bird skins are. They're not just, you know, stuffed birds to take a look at now and again. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, the this is such an interesting topic uh, for, for me because uh, working in rare books in uh, special collections, it brings a lot of the themes together, uh, which is all, what we're all about, which is, uh, first of all, uh, a collection of rare books, a rare archive, the Mary Wickham Bond archive that's here at the Rare Book Library. Um, second of all, collectors, you, you, you showed that car, you showed letters, um, you, sh you talked about that book that was sold. Um, and that's what uh, special collections are all about. Uh, you're looking at the commodification of history almost, objects being bought and sold, and these things have prices. And then the other thing that, that uh, your talk touches on is the mystery. There's a lot of mystery and intrigue. And that really ties into the history of rare books, the history of book collection and so forth. So. I think that's, I don't see any more questions or anything like that. I can speak personally, this was a fascinating talk. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely, I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, it will be recorded, we'll share it uh, as a YouTube presentation, so feel free to share the talk with, uh, with other friends. So uh, that's it, thank you, Jim. Thank you, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure uh, hosting you. And uh, we started working on this years ago, and uh, it's nice that it finally came to fruition uh, about a year and a half later. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everybody.